Thanks for watching. Let's talk about appendicitis. It's inflammation of the appendix. It's one of the most common abdominal emergencies worldwide, one of the most common causes of abdominal pain that requires surgery. And appendectomies are the most common emergency surgical procedure in childhood, and they're the most common non-obstetric surgical emergency that occurs during pregnancy. There are about 300,000 appendectomies performed in the United States every year. 60,000 to 80,000 of those are going to occur in childhood. The exact cause remains unknown, but there are two different kind of clinical presentations. One clinical presentation, a person has simple non-perforated appendicitis, no problems with that, may actually cure by itself. A lot of people probably have appendicitis, don't even know it, don't complain about anything, don't go to the doctor, they seem to get better. And then we have the other type where we have gangrenous problems and we have perforation. Those people can develop intra-abdominal infections. Those people have a higher incidence of complications. They may even have problems prior to the time they get to the hospital. So two different groups. Overall, the prevalence lifetime is about 8% slightly greater in men, slightly less in women, but overall the number of surgeries performed in men and women is about the same. The peak age for appendicitis is about 10 to 20. There's another hike in people between the ages of 1 and 4, but you could develop appendicitis at any age. Overall, if we look throughout the world, there's a significant variation in the incidence of appendicitis, so it's 16 percent lifetime prevalence in South Korea, as opposed to 8% here, as opposed to less than 2% in Africa. The appendix itself is an organ, L, that's about three to four inches long. It sits at the cecum, which is the large intestine, just about an inch after the small intestine joins with the large intestine. Sometimes it has a little valve, we call it the valve of Gerlach that separates the opening from the general opening of the colon. The appendix seems to have a lot of lymph tissue. Lymph tissue like you would get in your neck when you have a, an infection that becomes swollen. Same thing happens but with a higher concentration in the appendix. And we also have a lot of nerve tissue there. Nerve tissue from the autonomic nervous system. We call it the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. That can lead to some of the pain, some of the other kind of problems. What's the function of the appendix? Well, it's debatable. Uh, the appendix may well have something to do with the immune system because it has all of those lymphocytes, so it's what we call the gut-associated lymph tissue, and the more we learn about the microbiome, the more that seems to be very important. And the other function of the appendix is it has a lot of biofilm. Biofilm is an area where bacteria can lurk that are protected from antibiotics and from a whole bunch of other things. They live in their own universe. And it seems that after a person develops massive diarrhea or a person has an infection in the intestine or maybe a person takes antibiotic and you wipe out the bacteria, it seems that the appendix may well be the repository that repopulates the large intestine. Symptoms of appendicitis, strongest predictor is pain that begins in the mid-epigastrium, just around the navel or in the pit of the stomach. And then after a period of around 24 hours, it seems to migrate to the lower right quadrant. It's tender to touch down there. And it becomes worse within a matter of hours. It's worse with movement or deep breathing. It's worse with coughing or sneezing. Some people develop some constipation or diarrhea, but it's that peri-umbilical, peri epigastric pain. And it's pain that's often quite severe. Pain that's different than any other kind of pain you have experienced. Waking you suddenly at night oftentimes. And then comes the nausea and then comes the vomiting. Not vice versa. So you don't get the nausea and the vomiting. And then the pain. That tends to mean that you have some other kind of condition. Now you can also have a lot of other symptoms. You could have low-grade fever, high-grade fever. You could have inability to pass gas. You can have feeling that if you have a bowel movement, it's going to relieve the pain. You could have abdominal distension or mass. You can have the tenderness and the guarding. 
But overall, if we look at the classic textbook definition of what appendicitis is, it's going to be present in fewer than 50% of the people who make it to the doctor. Usually the person is lying down with the hips flexed and the knees drawn up to decrease the movement because any kind of movement seems to elicit more pain, the pain especially in that right lower quadrant, what we call McBurney's point. The duration of the symptoms tends to be less than 48 hours before you seek medical care for the overwhelming majority of adults, but it could be longer, especially if you happen to be elderly or if you happen to have a perforation. And in children, 80% of the children who are less than three may present with perforation. Now overall, in children who have what would appear to be an acute abdomen, only 20 to 30 percent of them are going to have appendicitis. 50 percent are going to have some other benign condition that seems to heal by itself. And if we look at the preschool age children, they present with atypical features that makes it very difficult to diagnose. Same thing with pregnant women oftentimes. When we look at the conditions that may cause symptoms that can be mistaken for appendicitis, the number is legion. It could be gastroenteritis, and typically, certainly, a person is more likely to develop gastroenteritis than appendicitis, but you could also have constipation or diarrhea or an intestinal obstruction or an ulcer or a kidney stone. Maybe you have a gallstone or a pelvic inflammatory disease, ovarian tumors or ectopic pregnancy or abdominal adhesions or certain kind of tumors or diabetic ketoacidosis or inflammatory bowel disease or viral hepatitis or acute pancreatitis, all of those are possible. What causes appendicitis? The answer is we just flat out don't know. It's thought, well, maybe it has to do with an infectious agent because there is some clustering of appendicitis in time and in space. Certainly genetics have a role because it seems that those people who have a history of appendicitis in the family are more likely to develop appendicitis. And it seems to have something to do with the environment because it tends to be more common in the summer, whether it's due to viruses that are present in the summer, maybe dehydration, don't honestly know. Pregnant women are less likely to develop appendicitis during their third trimester of pregnancy, and non-whites seem to have a decreased risk of appendicitis, but they tend to have a higher risk of perforation of the appendicitis, and especially in children, we can get a condition that we call neurogenic appendicitis, where the cause of the pain seems to be excessive proliferation of those nerves that I've mentioned before that are inside the appendix, and that's probably part of the reason why a higher incidence of children who are operated on for appendicitis seem to have a normal appendix. Now we can get this hyperproliferation of the lymphoid tissue that's down there, maybe because of an infection with a bacteria or a virus or a fungus or a parasite, and that lymphoid hyperplasia may block the egress of material from the appendix. That's one idea. Maybe it's an inflammatory process, maybe inflammatory bowel disease or a fibrous band or a foreign object that you've swallowed, maybe it's a tumor of some sort, maybe it's just uh, an adherence of fecal material, we call it a fecal lith, that's a popular idea, but something might cause obstruction of the egress of the appendix so that the material can't get out. The goblet cells continue to manufacture their secretions, but they're blocked from escape. So we get bacterial overgrowth and distension, and then when we get the distension, we get the visceral pain, kind of like when you've eaten too much. But as we get more and more pressure, then we get pressure on the veins and subsequently pressure on the arteries, and that can interfere with the health of the tissue. And then the bacteria can get across the margin of the unhealthy tissue, and the bacteria can compromise the appendix and then they can get into the surrounding tissue and that causes proliferation of the symptom and gets even worse if there happens to be a perforation. Now, recent studies have shown that there's an increase in the pressure inside the appendix and in the lumen of the appendix in only about a quarter of the cases of appendicitis. And the idea about the hardened mass of fecal material or anything else well, it's about 18% in people who have appendicitis, but it's about 30% in people who don't have appendicitis. So that's probably not the cause. Now, 
we have to segregate the appendicitis into two different families. We have one is the simple inflammation of the appendix that comes without gangrene, without necrosis. Maybe we have a little bit of bacterial leakage, but everything seems to be self-contained. And then we have the other more aggressive, more virulent form where we get the bacteria outside the intestine, either because of a microperforation, macroperforation, and that tends to need some kind of a surgical intervention. If it happens to be relatively mild, then we can perhaps follow the individual. If it happens to be more severe, obviously, depending on the symptoms, then that might need a surgical intervention. Well, if we look at the people who have the perforated appendix versus the non-perforated appendix, it appears that they have completely different courses. And why they have those different courses, we don't know. It might be due to the inflammatory response of the body, because obviously everybody is genetically a little bit different, so some people have more intense inflammatory response, some have less, and it also might depend on the microbiome, the kind of bacteria that happen to be in your colon. More of the good kind of bacteria, more of the bad kind of bacteria, and the more we learn about the microbiome, the more complicated it seems to be, and the more it seems to impact on disease. Now, if we compromise the arterial supply because we have too much pressure or because we have some other situation developed inside the appendix, that's when we can get some bacteria that get into the abdomen, the abdominal cavity, the peritoneal cavity, and then they can cause a local peritonitis or they could cause a general peritonitis. Local peritonitis, if it's walled off, walled off by the omentum and the, the mesentery and maybe some of the other organs that happen to be nearby that can sort of wall it off, or if they're not, then we have the bacteria gaining abscess, access to the abdominal cavity, and that's a significant problem. Well, how do we make the diagnosis? Physical examination, obviously, the right quadrant pain, the tenderness, the rebound, the guarding, all of those give us a hint. And then we do some simple blood tests. We do a white count. We do a test of inflammation, the C-reactive protein. If a person has the pain for at least 24 hours and has a normal C-reactive protein, they don't have appendicitis, so that's pretty good rule out. We check the liver function, check the pancreas function, all done simply with blood tests. If it's a, a woman who's in the reproductive years, obviously a pregnancy test is very important. A urine test is also important to rule out kidney stones. And then we stratify the person with regard to likelihood. Is this likely to be appendicitis? Is it unlikely to be appendicitis? And that helps guide us to decide whether we're going to do an ultrasound examination, whether we're going to do a CAT scan, and sometimes we can use some prognostic scores. There's something called the Appendicitis Inflammatory Response Score that takes into consideration a variety of different factors. So we look at the nausea and vomiting and the anorexia, and we look at the migration of the pain to the right lower quadrant, the pain in the right lower quadrant, and the likelihood of rebound look at the temperature, is it a little bit elevated, a lot elevated, a shift in the white blood count, is it a little shift, like more than 10,000, or is it a lot more than 15,000? Do we have some of those neutrophils that specifically fight bacteria? Are they more than 70 percent, more than 85 percent? All of that's important, but probably one of the most important factors is what's the C-reactive protein? That's a sign of inflammation. If it's really high, then chances are we've got a major issue here. Well, now we've got the stratification, so we want to do some kind of test if it seems that the appendicitis is likely. One of the tests that we do is an ultrasound examination. Ultrasound examinations are pretty good. They're not great, but they're pretty good. It all depends on the operator. Some of the operators are very good. Some of them are not and it has to do with the technical capabilities of the individual. So it's operator dependent. It's better if it's a relatively thin child, say, than an obese individual who's had multiple surgeries prior to the time. So all of that has to be taken into account. Well, ultrasound sort of is the standard, and it's been the standard here in the United States for a long time, still the standard in Europe, but here in the United States we've sort of transitioned over to the CAT scan. They have not transitioned over to the CAT scan in different countries nearly as much as we have. It's a more accurate test, but it requires a special machinery and 
uh, has some, some problems also associated with it, with the x-ray, with whatever else. We have MRIs. They're not done terribly frequently for diagnosis of appendicitis. But if we now look at treatment, well, how do we treat appendicitis? Most people say that, hey, if you have appendicitis, we do surgery. That's the standard kind of therapy. Well, that's certainly the traditional therapy, but now at least there's the thought that a lot of cases of appendicitis, especially the simple appendicitis, the non-perforated appendicitis, might not need surgery. There's a controversial area, but more doctors are saying, well, we can watch it or maybe even treat with antibiotics early on if the person doesn't seem to have any kind of major problem. Got the idea from Navy personnel who were at sea, who had appendicitis and they didn't have any access to surgery. A lot of them seemed to get better. Same with the merchant marine, same with patients who had conditions that made them non-operative candidates. They couldn't have surgery and many of them seem to get better. Now sometimes they fail after a while, so as many as a quarter of the people who are treated non-surgically ultimately are going to need surgery, but it seems that there is at least a significant incidence of self-curing appendicitis or curing appendicitis with antibiotics. The idea came originally from way back in 1902 when Ochsner, the famous Ochsner of the Ochsner Clinic in New Orleans, he came up with the idea, hey, if we see these people and we get them relatively early, we don't probably need to do any surgery. But that idea sort of fell into disregard until the mid-1950s when it was resurrected. And at that time, they thought, geez, if you came to medical attention and you had the pain for more than 24 hours and you hadn't perforated, chances are you're not going to perforate. So let's treat you expectantly. And then they got the idea, well, geez, uh, what happens if you don't perforate and it's less than 24 hours? Maybe we'll watch you. So in 1977, they did a big study and found that there was a significant incidence of people being able to avoid the surgery. But the studies uh, on those individuals who are treated without surgery haven't been the greatest. There's a uh, significant variation on the number of people in the studies and the qualifications to get into the study and the inclusion criteria. But all that aside, it appears that a significant number of people can be treated with antibiotics. Intravenous antibiotics oftentimes for the first 24 hours, up to three days actually, and then for the rest of a seven to 10 day course with oral antibiotics, sometimes even with just oral antibiotics. And oftentimes surgery can be completely avoided. Now it seems to be most likely that you can avoid surgery if your C-reactive protein is, say, less than 60, if your white count is less than 12,000, if you happen to be less than age 60, and you take standard antibiotics, maybe some augmentin, maybe add to it some metronidazole, and overall about anywhere between 75%, 95% of the people seem to do quite well. And if subsequently you need surgery, it doesn't seem like the complication rate has been increased. Now, as far as surgery is concerned, the first surgery to remove the gallbladder was 1735. And McBurney, the guy whose name is associated with that point in the lower right quadrant where the pain seems to be the maximal, he came out in 1893 with standard operation. And the standard operation that he performed in 1893 was used right up till basically the present time. About 19, nine, in 1981, a German gynecologist, a gentleman named Dr. Sem, he came up with the idea that he could remove the gallbladder through a laparoscope. And he performed the first laparoscopic gallbladder removal. And that was sort of poo-pooed by the surgeons at the time. But by the 1990s, it was sort of catching on. So much so that by the late 1990s, actually, people were trying to experiment instead of with multiple ports with three or four openings, they were trying to do it with only one opening. And, and then some people said, hey, for cosmetic reasons, let's not even do it through the abdomen. Let's use the laparoscope and go through the rectum. Let's go through the stomach. Let's go through perhaps the vagina. And then we can remove, forget about those ideas. Well, according to the 
surgical societies, the American College of Surgeons, the Society for Surgery, the Alimentary Tract, the World Society for Emergency Surgery. Mm, surgery is still the standard way. And it's laparoscopic surgery. The open surgery, the laparotomy, well, that's sort of fallen into disuse. And actually, some of the surgeons go through their entire training programs and never perform an open appendectomy. They all do it with the laparoscope. Now, sometimes when you begin doing the procedure with a laparoscope, you have to convert over to an open procedure. An open procedure because there are complications or because the person is too heavy or the person's had previous surgery and has some issues with scar tissue or maybe there's an infection inside the abdominal cavity and then you need to switch. But otherwise, if it's a simple laparoscopic removal of the appendix, person could go home in a day or two. Sometimes people are even trying to experiment with the day surgery. If you're going to have the appendicite, uh, appendectomy through the laparoscope, oftentimes you're given a bolus of antibiotic about 60 minutes or so prior to the time of surgery. Most people, if it's a simple surgery, aren't going to need any kind of antibiotic afterward. If there's some complications, then a person might take some antibiotics afterward. But if a person has some abscess formation, then it would appear that maybe surgery should be delayed. And oftentimes what happens is you're treated with antibiotics for a while to cool everything off, and then you're supposed to come back to the hospital six or ten weeks later, and then you have the surgery. But a lot of people seem to get better and don't even need the surgery. Only 6 to 20 percent of the people are going to have some sort of a complication, some sort of a need to go through the surgery. So the question is, well, if you have the surgery and you find that, oh my goodness, the appendix isn't inflamed, it appears to be completely normal, then what? Well, that happens, and it happens about 6 percent of the time. That's standard here in the United States, up to 6%. It's about 6% in Switzerland. If you go to the United Kingdom, well, it's about 20%. 20% because they still rely on the ultrasound. They don't use the CAT scan as much. CAT scan seems to be much more accurate. And if you go over to the countries like India or China or countries in northern southern Africa or in the Middle Eastern countries, it's close to 30% of the people who are operated on seem to have normal appendix. Now, interestingly, if you have a normal appendix, at the time of uh, appendectomy, it seems that you have a higher risk of death five days later or five years later, 30 days later to, to five years later. And that's because something else was causing the pain and that hasn't been diagnosed and sometimes it could be very important. So with appendicitis, we have a very common clinical condition. We have 300,000 operations every year we have a lot of people who probably have appendicitis who don't realize that that's the cause of the problem, never see a doctor. We have more people who are seeing doctors and now there's a tendency, at least among some doctors, to believe that, well, you know, watchful waiting or antibiotic therapy can do the trick and as long as a person doesn't seem to have some sort of a complication, as long as perhaps the pain's been around for a little while, then maybe that's an appropriate way to go. Otherwise, the routine surgery seems to be, for uncomplicated appendicitis, relatively slick, low incidence of complications. It's when there's perforation that the incidence of complications increases. So that's the story of appendicitis. Hope you've enjoyed the show. If you have, maybe you subscribe, tell a friend. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.